Okay. So welcome to the September edition of the San Antonio and Austin user group. Uh, Going to go over a few, few laundry list items before we get started. Um, first of all, the speaker is Jeffrey Palermo. He's a Microsoft MVP. We talking about Azure Container Apps, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we are always looking for local speakers. Uh, if you are interested in speaking, reach out to Ashish or myself. I'll put our emails in the chat. Uh, all of the things I'm about to mention, I'm going to throw up in the chat here. Um, we are recording these monthly groups, and you can find these on a Google Drive. I uh, put in the chat there. I also want to shout out uh, another local group to San Antonio called DevSA. Um, just kind of very similar to .NET user group, just not specific to .NET, doing general tech meetup things. Uh, they have a Discord as well, which I put in the chat. There's also a September event, which I will be speaking at, actually. And this is an in-person event. Um, and I'm going to be going over a library called Test Containers used for integration testing with databases, if you're interested in that. And I mentioned this last week, but now it's kind of, or last month, rather, but now it's kind of coming up, is San Antonio Startup Week, which is in October, mid-October. And DevSA will, will have a slot there. We'll have food and networking, well, yada, yada. And finally, there's a feedback form for uh, this session. So not only for Jeffrey, also for the group. Uh, if you're interested in speaking, if you have feedback on things you would like to see from the group, uh, just throw anything in that form. Um, so yeah, I'll throw it over to Ashish or Laura. If they'll have anything else. Yeah, I actually don't have anything else. Uh, thanks for all the info. And uh, yeah, with that, I guess we'll hand it over to Jeffrey. Yeah, I actually, uh, Jesse Hernandez leads up the DevSA stuff, and I see he's in this call, so you can reach out to him as well if you're curious about any of those things. So. Yeah. There he is. Yeah. All right, now, go for it, Jeffrey. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, great. I'm excited uh, to uh, speak again at the Austin.net user group, and it's, it's great that uh, San Antonio and Austin, yeah, just, what, an hour and a half, uh, hour and a half drive away. Depending on traffic, uh, could be more, but um, so let's dive into it because I know we, uh, we we've got to kind of fit it within everybody's lunch hour, and I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so, Azure Container Apps is kind of new as of you know a couple of years, um, and it's out there. It's it's a part of it's a part of Azure, and people are using it. And a you know a a new big revision just was released with Azure Container Apps to kind of change some things. Um, so if you looked at Azure Container Apps when it first came out, um, but haven't done it since, then you know there's another big revision. Um, but I also want to do it in the context of .NET 8 and Kubernetes and containers just in general. Uh, but overall, it, the promise of it is to lower production costs while increasing deployment and operations flexibility um, and and it can run basically anything but you put it together with .NET 8 and it's a really powerful combination for custom applications and um, and you can drive down the cloud costs so we're going to see how these fit together and um, and we'll talk about which parts fall nicely into place together and, and maybe where the rough edges are and my hope is that you'll come away knowing what architectural choices to make for your next Azure and .NET project. So um, just quick, uh, a quick overview of where I'm coming from. Um, at, at clear measure, we're a full service software and architecture, software architecture and engineering firm that serves companies that are building business critical software projects using Microsoft technologies. Um, and you see a cluster of technologies on the left um, and uh, a, a, a heavy focus on doing a great job at software is, is agile, is DevOps, is software engineering practices. 
is design patterns. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from. I've been programming since 1997 and largely the, the Microsoft platform the entire time. Um, uh, before I kind of get into the topic, uh, I have my, my latest book, .NET DevOps for Azure, um, have an agreement with the publisher. If anyone would like a full electronic copy of the book and you don't have it, just send me an email. It's on the screen and I'd be happy to send you a copy. Um, and hopefully within about another month to a month and a half, um, my fifth book will be published and, uh, just, I don't, I don't have a, a picture of it because it's not quite ready, but if you're, if you're interested, if you're in, uh, if you lead software teams, it's called the five pillars, uh, software leadership for effective custom software. And so that one's coming out and it's aimed at people who are leading software engineering teams, uh, as opposed to a particular technology, uh, or whether, you know, .NET, seven, eight, ASP.NET, MVC, or DevOps. Um, so, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. And my belief for everybody, and we do it at work too, a clear measure, but, but my belief for, for every programmer is, and every team, every programming team, when equipped and trained properly, every team can be successful. Every team can deliver world-class custom software. Um, and that's what I'm motivated for. I also, besides user group talks, I love to facilitate uh, various uh, various forums, and there's we have one called the Software Architect Forum, and we also have another one called the the Software Leadership Forum. But either way, um, if, if you're if you manage a software team or if you are kind of a lead engineer or architect of a software team, um, I facilitate some meetings that you may be interested in. All right, let's dive in Azure Container Apps, and let's just talk about the themes. Um, of this latest wave of .NET 8 and how it, it interacts with Azure. So a big theme of .NET 8 is to make, to make all of .NET applications cloud native. And there's some themes that go within there, um, observability, resiliency, scalability, manageability. But the big one that, uh, the big one in this theme that's being pushed out from the .NET side is observability. And there are some extra libraries that have come into play that, yes, you can use them on any .NET application, but they really fit well, like a glove, when you're deploying to Azure Container Apps. Um, so there's some libraries in NuGet. If you've never heard of them, if you've never looked them up, I'll just highlight, for example, uh, extensions.diagnostics.healthchecks.common. Um, it's on the it's on the left side, and that adds the ability to to uh, to have an abstraction for various health checks, and it just it adds an interface to your services collection to the built in um, to the built in IOC container, and then you can have any class that implements the interface, the I health check essentially, and you can run a, a few lines of code that check on something, and then. You have this this API, this URL. Call it whatever you want. I'll show you, I'll show you a little bit later. And effectively, when you call that endpoint, or you have a monitoring tool, call that endpoint. You know, every minute or so, it goes and finds every class that implements the eye health check interface. And you're running all those little tiny bits of lines of code, checking various things to make sure that every part of your application is online, is working. Um, because for example, if, if there's a hiccup with the network between the application and the database or a queue or your connection out to a payment processor or um, a connection with uh, Azure files or just any, any, any integration point, then some function of your application is gonna have a hiccup and uh, you don't wanna wait until your users complain about it, you want to know right away. So at the minimum, you want to implement a health check for absolutely every integration between your application and something outside of the process that your application is running in. 
So that's a no brainer. And there's, there's a lot of other libraries, but they're, they're under these themes. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go deep into everything because there's all kinds of you know content from Microsoft that covers every single one of these. Along with being cloud native, there has been a big push over the last year specifically for containers and and inherently the containers are running on Linux images. So with .NET Core uh, breaking away from .NET Framework 4.8 4 uh, and that dependency on Windows has been broken where now .NET 8 can run pretty much anywhere. Now, the big place you wanna run it is on Linux, but not just running on Linux, running it inside a container in Linux or um, you know, for testing purposes, running it inside uh, Windows subsystem for Linux using Docker Desktop on Windows. And so there's been a lot of work to make um, to make the container story for .NET easier, smaller images, more compact, um, having non-root base images, a, a non-port 80 default port, uh, just for a little bit extra security layer. So there's been a lot of work put into that. Um, so in the theme of containers, there is container size improvements. Uh, and that has been phenomenal. You can just look at the graph and see, um, you know, how much smaller each of the container images are. All right. Um, just know, and, and they keep on working on that. If you haven't, if you, if you didn't look at the content coming out from .NET Conf last November, or some of the you know more recent announcements, um, you definitely want to look at .NET Aspire. It came out, um, it, it came out really just uh, at the past build conference, but it was announced at the .NET Conf when .NET 8 came out. Um, and there's gonna be you know, quite a bit of improvements with the .NET 9 wave, but .NET Aspire is going to uh, really streamline your applications and make it even more simple to be to be Azure cloud native, and I'll just I'll touch on this. It's not a deep dive into into Aspire, but just a, a touching on what it provides. And the most exciting thing that it provides for me is dependency. Yes, metrics, distributed traces, and structured logs. It makes those more streamlined. But there's been solutions for that for a while. It just kind of makes it more automatic for. .NET developers, so you don't have to think about it. But managing the dependencies is huge. And I'll, I'll kind of show you what that looks like. I'm just going to uh, fast forward to here. We've never had, this by the way, is the new project type called the .NET Aspire app host. We've never had before inside the structure of a Visual Studio solution, any type of code that actually described the structure of the Visual Studio solution and the dependencies of the runtime dependencies of each of the projects in that Visual Studio solution. There's been project references, which are build time dependencies, but not the runtime dependencies. And so with .NET Aspire, the promise of it is if we describe the runtime structure of the application, uh, which by the way, an application can have multiple different processes. You could have a, a web application. You could have a, a web service a web service project that's deployed you know, somewhere else. You could have a, a web job. You could have um, a, uh, a, a SQL Server database. Um, you could have a Redis cache or, or anything else. And so you have multiple deployable processes that live in the same Visual Studio solution. And that's actually normal. And that tends to be the way it is all the time. Um, and e e even, even if you've pushed on the, on the microservices pattern a little bit and, you know, decomposed a lot of things, you end up with visual studio solutions that still have more than a single process to deploy, you know, uh, uh, logical independent services can still have, and, uh, and very often do have multiple processes to deploy, even though, um, from an architectural perspective, they are a single logical service. Um, so what .NET Aspire does is provide this, this code right here to, to allow you to describe it. And then there's tooling like the Azure Developer Console um, to 
to allow you not to have to create your own um, arm templates, Terraform templates, bicep templates. It basically uses this code to uh, generate on the fly the Azure resources in your DevOps pipeline and effectively give you an infrastructure as code capability in a more streamlined way. Now, I will say we're on version one of .NET Aspire and um, the command line story for complete DevOps automation is not there yet. Um, and so if you kind of jump in straight in, uh, just, just be aware uh, version one was released and the command, the, the totally unattended command line story is not yet there. Um, right now running the command lines with the authentication and the service keys and whatnot, it does require an attended experience. So you have to actually be at the console running command lines and, and, um, you know, authenticating, uh, whatnot. So, um, that's not quite ready. Uh, but they're working on it and it's going to happen. This is going to change quite a bit. And with Azure Container Apps, well, running web applications, web APIs, uh, just backend jobs that do something, all of those are going to funnel into Azure Container Apps. .NET Aspire architecturally has been designed so that f to feed applications into Azure Container Apps. Can it work with App Service and others? Yes, it can, and you can make it work, but it's been, the main use case has been Azure Container Apps. So that's going to fit like a glove. That's where they're doing uh, you know, most of the testing. Okay. I want to talk about the topology of what an Azure Container App is, and I want to compare that with Kubernetes. Um, I know that that we're probably split with some people having done some Kubernetes work and then other people not doing any Kubernetes work. And to be honest, um, Kubernetes came up, for, well, Docker in general came up from the Linux community because for the longest time, Microsoft has invested a just a ton of uh, effort into compatibility and making sure that um, you know things work on Windows servers really well together. They don't step on each other. And you know, for, for decades, it's been very common to deploy multiple things to a single Windows server and they work just fine. There's a synergy between major dependencies. They don't step on each other. Um, for example, if you're doing web apps, well, you have an IIS server and you could have you know, it's frequently you know, dozens and dozens of, of web applications on an IIS server. And then you, you, know, you, you create two of those servers or three or four in a cluster configuration for a web farm and it works just fine. And then you have some other, you know, scheduled tasks in the background. Um, and so that was just the case. Now, for non-Microsoft technologies and people who were using, you know, um, Linux servers uh, earlier on, that was not the case. And all the technologies that uh, that are out there, from from PHP to Python to Java to Ruby um, and C plus plus, there are on the on the Linux front and just the whole ecosystem. The there was and is still the problem of dependency conflicts. And so you put different you put all kinds of applications on the same server. Well, they have a different mix of dependencies that conflict with each other. And so the Linux part of the industry had a problem where segmentation of the operating system was absolutely a necessity. And that's why containers were more of have been more of a thing for Linux than Windows because it was super, super painful. Um, mixing multiple applications on the same Linux server and a different mix of dependencies, the, the dependencies conflicted with each other and it just didn't work. And so containers were an absolutely required solution if you were deploying to Linux servers. There wasn't any way around it. And 
sure, Microsoft created Windows containers to do kind of the same thing for Windows, but most people don't need Windows containers. Most people don't care about Windows containers because we just don't have the same pain that you have with the mix of technologies that typically go on Linux servers. And the it tends to be that, that the only people who are using Windows containers are ones with uh, you know, legacy applications that do have uh, conflicts or they want to uh, have special needs. But the average .NET developer is not going to care about Windows containers. It's just not going to happen. Um, but let's go back over to, to Linux containers. And uh, what has happened is with Azure and other cloud providers, um, the, the very, very thin Linux server has been very economically viable. And then adding the container technology on top of Linux has made the density at the data center um, a lot higher than the density for, for comparable Windows servers. And so Azure and AWS and everybody has adopted Win Linux as kind of their, their you know, base server for applications. And then it became hard to manage. And so Kubernetes, you know, sprouted up as a community project and some really smart people figured out how to how to orchestrate and manage lots and lots of containers on top of a Linux server. And then of course, not just one Linux server, but clustering multiple yeah. Linux servers together. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we had somebody unmuted. Um, so 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 that's kind of how it sprouted up. And now we have uh Azure, which has Azure Kubernetes service, where you can sprout up a Kubernetes cluster and you can use all of the features of Kubernetes. Um, and, but for most .NET teams, you don't need all the bells and whistles of Kubernetes. You don't need all the knobs. It, 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 it was built initially by some people who were in very large environments with lots and lots of challenges. And so you pull that back to smaller teams or smaller applications, you don't you don't have all those challenges. You you just kind of need some basic clustering. You just kind of need some basic orchestration on top of the container. So you don't need all of the knobs and switches of Kubernetes. You just need a few. And so Azure created Azure Container Instance as an attempt to you know, have a simpler interface. Um, and that's available in Azure right now, but it it, it didn't really meet uh, the mark. It didn't have the most streamlined experience. And so uh, the, the new service as of a few years ago is Azure Container Apps. And I want to go over the corollary between that and Kubernetes because Azure Container Apps literally is a layer of usability on top of Azure Container Service, okay? So you can you can create AKS, Azure Container Service in Azure, or you can create an Azure Container app that is basically going to be a slice of an Azure Container uh, Service. Now, there's a few concepts I want to talk about, and that is the Azure Kubernetes cluster. So you're going to see two services in Azure, one is called the Azure Container Environment, and one is called the Azure Container App. You can't just go in and create an Azure Container App first by itself. You have to create the Azure Container Environment as well. A lot of you are probably familiar with um, Azure App Service, and same thing. You can't create an app right out of the bat. You, you have to create the service plan, and the service plan is kind of the umbrella where you define what kind of server you want, how much memory and, and all that. And then you can create, you know, a, a good number of apps within that service plan. Um, it's a similar parent-child relationship. You have to create your Azure container environment. And when you do that, you are effectively getting access to a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, that's what you get when you create your, your uh, Azure container environment. Then... Within the environment, you can create um, any number any number of container apps. And when you create a container app, you are creating a pod, 
a Kubernetes pod. Within a pod, you can create, you can run a number of containers. And I'm not going to go into it, but if, you, if you're looking into this, you want to look into the Dapper service, D-A-P-R, not to be confused of the micro ORM, D-A-P-P-E-R, but D-A-P-R. Um, and when you configure that as a part of your Azure Container app, it gives you some things for free. You add the Dapper libraries to your, your application and it takes advantage of, of multiple containers running inside a single pod and it's called a sidecar container. And, and it, because the Kubernetes cluster around every, around the pods is going to do virtual networking for you is going to, to isolate you in your own subnet, uh, DAPR allows you to basically register that you're that you have some code running in a container, and you register a friendly name in Dapper, and then from another container running in a different pod, you can basically ask the library, "Hey, can you give me the URL for this friendly name?" And you don't have to configure URLs and ports and, hey, where is this other guy running? If you have if you have an a, 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 one process that needs to call an HTTP endpoint on another process that's in a different container, it, it basically, I, it makes me think of dependency injection at the runtime level. You can register yourself and then other people can discover where you are within this Kubernetes cluster, within this Azure container environment. And, and so if you think about, if you think about an application or even a system of multiple applications that has 12 processes running, 12 containers running, doing various things, you got a web service, you got some web app, you got a front end web or a public web application. Maybe you've got a back end administrative application. You've got, you know, half a dozen in-service bus endpoints sitting, you know, just listening for messages coming in for over a queue, processing those things. You've got a dozen processes running around all doing little things. Each one of them is a container that is deployed to its own independent Azure Container app, but when it starts up, it's registering its friendly name with the DAPR, the Dapper service. And when one of them needs to call another, you don't have configuration hell when you're deploying to make sure that you poke into an environment variable configuration, the address of this other container, you can discover that address with a, a nice little line of code, a little bit of configuration code, and, and DAPR kind of keeps track of all that networking. And when you redeploy something or when you scale it or when uh, you change something where the underlying IP addresses and, and things change and rejigger around, you don't have to change any configuration. It's a it's a runtime registry of where everything is running. Now I will say one thing before another thing before I move move along. If you deploy one container to one Azure Container app, that's totally fine. It's it's no big deal. You can also and that's that's the that's the normal runtime model is one container revision per Azure Container app. Now you can run whatever bit of software that you want inside that container. And so if you want to run a single .NET process inside that container, that's up to you. I mean, it's really, it's defined by the Docker file, whatever you choose that to be, that's what it's going to be. Okay. Um, I will show you later. You can run multiple versions of a container image and and there's there's a uh, opportunity for kind of load balancing percentages of traffic from one to another um, but your basic use case is that you're going to have one container and you're going to run it in one pod well by definition the pod is the azure container app and you're going to have multiple azure container apps 
which are each a pod inside your Azure container environment, which is a Kubernetes cluster. All right, so that's the underlying architecture. And, and I think the rest will make sense once you understand that. Um, you see on the bottom, the Azure Container Registry. That is another Azure service. If, if, if you don't already have one, you will need to create an Azure Container Registry. You will create one of these for probably, you'll, you'll create one of these per software system. And I'll kind of give you a tour of it. The Azure, the Azure Container Environment is going to live per production or non-production environment because you don't want to you don't want to have non-production and production apps mixed in the same uh, Kubernetes cluster. And so, effectively, think about it. You're going to you want to have a Kubernetes cluster for production. You want to have a Kubernetes cluster for your manual test environment, and you want to have a Kubernetes cluster for your automated test environment. And that way, um, you can deploy all of all of the app all of the apps that make up your system on their own environment. So, uh, and then outside of each environment, you have the Azure Container Registry, which is the corollary to Azure Artifacts or a NuGet server that's going to have NuGet packages of deployable artifacts that are produced from your build server. Or if you have if you have zip files put in know, Azure files or blob storage or, or somewhere, or even if you save them to Team City or um, or the Octopus Deploy NuGet server, the corollary with the the place where you have put your release candidate packages ready for deployment, that is Azure Container Registry. And so Azure Container Registry is not per environment, it is per DevOps pipeline. Okay. All right. Let's, okay, let's move on. So let me, let me talk about the DevOps pipeline. Um, the good news with Azure Container Apps is that it's a new way to run your deployable .NET processes, but it actually doesn't change the fundamentals of DevOps automation or all of the, all of the capabilities that you need within a complete DevOps environment. Let me start from production and work my way backwards. So in, in a deployment pipeline, you need a minimum of three environments because there are three categories of environments and you need at least one of each. Everybody knows production, you need one of each, right? You might have multiple, but you need one of each. Moving back from production, that manual test environment, you need at least one environment where somebody can manually check on something and test something. Most teams have multiple manual test environments. They might have one called staging. They might have one called test. They might have one for, for product management or customer support, or they might have one for the sales team to do you know demonstrations of the next version. It's common, but the category is manual test environment. You need at least one and most teams have more than one based on based on the needs of the organization. Backing up from that, you need the the automated test environment. I like to call that environment the TDD environment to invoke, you know, test driven development because all these names tend to have three letter acronyms like UAT or SIT or some people call them DIT. And all. But I like to call it the TDD environment and that's for test automation. This environment, there's no humans allowed. All it's doing is run completely automated full system tests, whether they're um, Selenium or Playwright or or Fitness or whatever test framework that you have, it's just, it, you know, it's loading dummy data into a database, it's running some scenarios, it's blowing away data, it's, it's redeploying, it's stopping and starting things. And so for a person to go and do something on that type of environment doesn't make sense because everything's being yanked out from under them in the first place. Nothing is stable in a test automation environment. Um, but you need, you know, you need at least one. And of course, to the extent you want to parallelize and run your full suite of full system tests faster, you may have two so that you can split those tests and kind of assign them to different environments. Um, pulling back from that, uh, your package management, 
the, uh, that is going to be, if you're, if you're going to Azure container apps, that is going to be the container registry. Um, you're going to, you're going to register container images as your release candidate format and you, and package management now is going to have an Azure container registry. Whereas before you might've just had Azure artifacts in Azure DevOps to store you know, your, your packages as zip files or NuGet packages. Um, and so for the containerized deployable processes, you'll put those in Azure Container Registry. And for the deployable artifacts that are not containerized, you would still use um, you know, things like Azure Artifacts or uh, Octopus Deploys built in, built in NuGet Server. And then backing up from that, your your uh, your continuous integration build and your private build processes those don't actually change. Uh, the only thing that changes is the command lines that are in um, the command lines to actually package them. You're gonna you're gonna actually gonna be uh, running running Docker commands to create containers um, instead of just you know pushing it to um, NuGet package or you know zipping up files. Okay. Um, by the way, I was showing you the top third of, uh, a DevOps architecture poster, and this is the full poster. It's, it's, I know it's high resolution. You can't read it, but if, if anybody would like the full high resolution version of this DevOps architecture poster, then just send me an email. I'd be happy to send it to you. It's, it's meant to be sent to a print shop and printed on like two foot by three foot paper. Um, actually, I think I might have. Uh, so here's 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 the poster. I know you can't see it because of the, the blurring, but yeah, that's what it's that's the size that it's meant to be printed. You can put it on your wall. So if anybody wants that high resolution PDF, just let me know. I can happy to send it over to you. Okay, let's go into demos. I want to show you some things. Um, and these are the URLs. And if you want to do a screen grab, um, then you can uh, do it. Do a screen grab and look at those. Actually, I'm just gonna help you out and copy and paste into the chat so nobody has to worry about that. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna switch over and show you um, an application. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through these because these are self-explanatory. But let me just switch over and do some kind of overview demos. So the one the one URL I gave you was for um for a GitHub repository. Uh, if you just clone this and run the private build, then you'll be able to get going with it. And it has in here a Visual Studio solution that's very basic. It's the skeleton. It is the skeleton of the application. Um, and it has uh, it has configuration for Azure Container Apps. Um, you'll you'll want to ignore the the Maui parts to it. We're kind of adding some Maui capabilities. But if you're interested, it also has configuration for um, a pull request template for uh, for GitHub. It also has full configuration as code for Octopus Deploy um, deployments, if that's interesting to you. And it also has the uh, build configurations and deployments for um, Azure Pipelines. So here's the YAML for that structure. So it can help you get jump started if you want to use this as a skeleton. Okay. All right. Also, the URL for a um, project here. Um, I'm not going to dive into it, but um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to jump right into Azure since we're focusing on Azure Container Apps, and I'm going to show you um, show you what we have. So let me go to the uh, let me find the Container Registry. And that's that's actually outside of it. So we go here to the container registry. And if you've never looked at the container registry, this is what it looks like. By the way, uh, Azure the Azure portal they've recently done a, a kind of a reorganization, and so they've they've put various things in some of these sub menus because the left side has gotten so long. There's so many things that they're kind of reorganizing everything, and so. Um, what we're doing is uh, we're, this is our Azure Container Registry and we're looking for our repositories. Okay, now this, if you've never used an Azure Container Registry, I know, I know just container apps, 
is going to push a lot of .NET developers to use containers for the first time. Some people have been you know, using it for a long time and that's all great, but it's going to push the normal .NET developer to use containers for the uh, for the first time for, for many. And inside the container registry, um, think of the container registry as a NuGet server. Within a NuGet server, you can have many feeds and the feed is you know your application. So you have the registry within it, you have a repository. The best naming convention for a repository is the name of the application that you're gonna be deploying. And so inside my Visual Studio solution, if I had a web, web UI, a web application, and in this example, it was called churchbulletin.ui. Okay, that's just a regular web application. And I take that name, make that the name of the repository. And now inside, I clicked inside. Now inside, every time I run my integration build and have a new uh, release candidate, a new build for that, well, now the tag, the image tag is my build number, All right. So simple taxonomy. Azure is going to let you call your repository anything you want. It's going to let you call your image tag anything you want. But make, make the repository the name of the application and make the image tag the build number. That's going to be the simplest thing for you overall because ultimately... You don't want to accidentally treat this like a pet and give it a name. You want to treat it like cattle. You're giving it numbers, okay? Because ultimately, maybe you set it up for the first time, the first time you're working with it. But after that, you want everything to be automated and you're not even looking at it. You just want it to be automated. And so um, we found that that is the best way. This is the best way to have just a, a traceable convention because ultimately, when you have a dozen deployable apps in uh, in your system, well, you're going to have a dozen repositories, each with the name of whatever that deployable app is for you know, your web service app, your you know in-service bus endpoint one, in-service bus endpoint two, whatever the names of the processes that you're deploying, each one is packaged up as a release candidate with everything necessary to deploy that process. And so each one of those is going to be a repository. And within each repository, you're going to have multiple images, but each of the images are just a different version of that same deployable process. Okay. So that's the convention. That's, that's the easy button. Azure is going to let you do anything, um, but that's the easy button. Just do it that way. Okay. And so you know, click on, click on one of these. Um, images and you can see all the Docker stuff um, and you can see the command. If you want to pull that exact image using Docker pull um, and you can see the manifest, which is all the JSON that, you know, we don't want to read ourselves anyway. Okay. So that's the structure of the container registry. Um, and let's see, I'm just going to, by the way, this is the this is the app. This is the like default Blazor template. And we just kind of um, just kind of piggybacking off of that. So there's nothing fancy here, and <laughs> we upgraded to .NET eight, but we didn't change the text by the way. So uh, all right, slash version. All right, this is an extra um, web API controller. And all it does is look to see what version I have. Okay, it looks at it looks at the stamped version of the assembly, literally the dot the DLL file. Okay, so 11783, boom. Now, if I go into, let me go to the right one. Uh, make sure I'm in the right one. Yeah, okay. So if I go into this revisions, and um, one one seven one one seven eight three. See that? Okay, so there's our traceability. And by the way, this goes for Azure Container Apps or any other app. Actually, I've been I've been advocating for this technique for a long time, and that is in your uh, where was I? In, in your application make some place where it's very obvious to go and look and say, 
hey, what version am I running? And, and if you have confusion, do something so that it's obvious to see what environment you're running in. There are some people that will take a, that will, will augment the, the CSS style sheet and put like a very obviously colored border around the outsides just to let you know that you're not in production um, or, you know, color coded depending on, but just those are, those are hint, those are, those are things that are good to do regardless of what type of software, just make a little, make it easy on everybody. Because especially when you're testing, uh, somebody needs to do a bug report. It needs to be obvious what version of the software we found the bug in. So make it easy. But also with container apps, uh, we have the tag and we have right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this uh, container app. We're just going to walk the topology. So I talked about the Azure container environment. Let me just switch over. Here's the container environment and it lives inside a particular resource group. By the way, let's talk about resource group organization. Um, you want to make sure that you limit the resources that are in a particular resource group to a single environment. That, that's going to be the easy button. Again, Azure will let you do whatever you want, but you don't want a jumbled mess. And so the, 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 easiest, uh, the easiest segmentation for a resource group is one environment. So if you have, if you, have uh, um, you know, UAT environment, Boom, have a UAT resource group with all the stuff for UAT. If you have staging environment, same thing for that. If you have your TDD environment, same thing for that. For your prod environment, same thing for that. But for production, the best advice I have is put production in a separate Azure subscription. Now, Azure has role-based security and they have the capability to where you can create a harder security boundary around a particular resource group and only certain people and you have to elevate privileges to even see inside production resource groups and all that. Yes, it's technically possible to do that in Azure, but it's not easy. It's not the easy button. The, the Azure subscription itself is inherently a hard security boundary. And so when you're thinking about the concept of production versus non-production, it's easier to put the production resource groups in a totally different Azure subscription that is a production Azure subscription. And think about it, the all of your billing is at the uh, subscription level and production, uh, you know, production bills, they need to go probably to a certain different place. And then non-production is, is more elastic and we turn things off and we say, hey, you know what, the team is, pretty much, you know, not going to be working either over the weekend or a three-day holiday or whatever it happens to be. Guess what? Everything in this subscription, let's just turn it off because nobody's going to be using it anyway. We we talk about things like that to, to manage our budget. We don't have those kinds of conversations with production. So having that hard, hard separation is a good thing to do. Okay. So this is, this is the container apps environment within apps, I can go and I can create any number of, of you know, different apps that are gonna run inside a container, inside this Kubernetes cluster. Again, it's a synonym. Azure container environment is Kubernetes cluster. So you can already see that, that you know, Azure is making it easy for me to even put a function app in here. Why? because Azure's just going to bundle that thing into a container for me and run it as a pod inside um, inside an assigned node inside my cluster. By the way, there's no corollary in here for a Kubernetes node, okay? Because that's just being managed for me. The uh, I have a cluster at my disposal. I don't have to manage the concept of the multiple servers that make up the multiple Kubernetes nodes in which a pod um, exists. Azure just does that for me, and I'm glad it. I'm glad it does it. Okay, so let's look at a few things because this on the left is actually quite new if you used it before, and that is ingress. This is where you can you know you can do some DNS, you can have your own URLs and, and all that. And there's I mean there's so many different. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about all the settings because that would be going deep. But I am going to go into uh, user group prod, okay? 
that's what we stand for. And you have your application URL. Um, and by the way, if I copy that and I put it in the chat and I can invite everyone to just click on it and then go to the forward slash version URL and you, know, you should be able to see that come up. Um, okay. So I'm going to highlight a few things within, within here. Actually, let's, let's just do, let's just do a little live demo, which is the riskiest and let's see if it crashes and burns or not, because it shouldn't. All right. I'm going to go to revisions and replicas. And if I want to manually deploy using a click, click, click on the mouse, I can come into the active revision and I can see, um, I can see what's there, or I can go to containers and I can say edit and deploy. If I just want to, if I just want to change it and I click on the name and I see that my registry has come up. Okay. I can see that the image, by the way, this is, this is a little bit tricky. If you've never done it before, you see the name of the image, it's labeled image here, but what are we really looking for? We're actually looking for the repository name of the registry that we selected. So this label really should be called, um, it really should be called um, repository, registry repository, right? Because that's effectively what it is. And then the image tag, all right, 783. So we have 783, you know what? We're gonna go back one to 782. And by the way, this is where and but with command lines or not, you can choose to run, you know, some percentage of a CPU core or two cores. You can give it some amount of memory. And this is where you add environment variables. By the way, with container images, they're immutable. If you're used to poking in things into um, app settings.config um, or, or, you know, even older web.config, if you're used to poking in things into app settings, that doesn't work anymore because images are immutable. So whatever you package to the image is configuration that should be constant across every environment, okay? It should be application level configuration, not environment level configuration. The environment level configuration when deploying with containers here is done via environment variables. So. Um, connection string to a database, address of a, a subscription or topic queue, um, whatever it happens, any kind of URL for an outside payment service or something like that. You're not going to poke it into a config file. You're going to add an environment variable and you can have the source be uh, plain text if it's not particularly, you know, secret or secret with, you know, Azure, Azure key store or, um, you know, someplace where nobody can Nobody can go in and, um, you know, look at it in plain text. Okay, let me get rid of these. And we're backing up to 782. We're going to hit save and we're going to hit create. We're going to, so we're deploying a revision. And this typically, what, what it's doing, um, think of it if you're familiar with app service, it's spinning up the container. Now the container is warm. We test to make sure it's online. And then what under the covers, it does the same thing like a like a VIP switch in app service or a staging slot. But you know, Kubernetes had the mechanism of bringing a new container on board in the pod and then changing the networking. So boom, now the other one is instantly active and there's no perceived downtime. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm we're 783. I'm going to click here, moment of truth, 782. Did everybody else who's following along get 782? Good. All right. So that's basically how you do it. Now, command lines, that's actually what's more interesting, um, is, is the command lines to do an upgrade. Um, and it's it's not that hard. It's just it's, it's the AZ command line. And by the way, I don't have time to go into it, but if you go into the, let's see, what file are they in? If you go into... Um, is it Azure Pipelines? Delete. Uh, that's in the Octopus Deploy configuration. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go splunking in, into there. But there, all the command lines, all the command lines for operating Azure Container apps in a totally unattended, automated way are in this 
Git repositories, Azure pipelines, and Octopus deploy configuration files. So you can kind of you know see what command lines and what uh, what command line switches work. The last thing that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna touch on is when you create the app. Oh, by the way, I'll talk about one feature. We can choose the revision mode. We can change it to multi-revision. What that does is it allows us to have multiple active revisions and then it enables this little text box so that I can actually have, you know, 50-50 or I can have, you know, 80-20 or I can have, you know, 80-25-5 or eight, no, 80-10-5-5. And I can literally split the traffic between multiple revisions and that's kind of another way to do application level um, feature flags or traffic splitting if I want to just kind of test out something new. Um, that, that capability is available. All right. When you create a new Azure Container app, it is not online by default. That's actually a change from when uh, the first version of Azure Container Apps came on. By default, this enabled checkbox is not checked, okay? So they've changed it now so that when you deploy to Azure Container Apps, it's not immediately open to the world. <laughs> okay, which is a good change because there's a lot of containers that don't need to be open to the world, especially if you're just running in the background, listening to a queue and processing messages. It's not something that you even want a public network connection to. And so to, to get a you know URL like what I just showed you, you click the enabled box there, and then you change from limited to container apps environments, meaning pod to pod or app to app communication, to sorry, to click on this, which is accept traffic from anywhere, so that now it's actually on the internet and you can get to it. All right, and then you've got some additional additional settings that you can mess with. But um, in the most basic forms, if you create a new uh, Azure Container app and you're like, oh, here's the U it won't give me a URL. Why can't I get online? Come into Ingress. Click enabled, change to accept traffic from anywhere, click save, and now you will be online and you can kind of run it through its paces. Okay, so I know that is a, a lot of information whirlwind into a um, into a quick talk. So let me switch back slide and um, I'm going to leave it. Actually, I've already given you these. So let me uh, let me take questions for the remaining couple of minutes we have in the lunch hour. Um, and I'll look at the chat also, but you can just bring yourself off of mute and uh, and do it that way as well. Any questions? Yeah, anyone have questions for Jeffrey? I have questions, just thank you. Been a wonderful, wonderful uh, exposition. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, okay. I have a question. Yes, sir. So I'm um, I'm fairly new uh, to this world. Uh, being really just you know uh, was working software in the prem, and we are actually moving into the cloud. Um, we're changing everything. Um, so my question is when when you were talking about the sizing, right? to consider uh, Kubernetes for the orchestration? Like, is there a, like a recommendation of how many containers do you really need running to start considering like orchestration through AKS versus, you know, like just working in uh, container app services? Uh, I'm not sure anybody has a rule for that, but this is, these are some of the symptoms that you might, that you might look for um, because we, we have, we have a client where we have implemented the full AKS with every knob and every button and helm charts. And boy, is it a lot of work. And when I look back on it, and by the way, this was before Azure Container Apps came out. But as I look back on it, I think, man, if I was doing that all over again, Azure Apps Server, Azure Container Apps would make it so much simpler. So I don't think there's a I don't think there's a number of number of apps or a size or, or a performance characteristics of your application, I think I think it's more of what capabilities do you need in your architecture? If uh, if you have 
if you have existing .NET applications that you're just going to containerize and you've been running your own, you know, fairly manageable uh, clusters of servers on premise or even Azure App Service, uh, you probably do not need to operate your own Kubernetes cluster. And when I say that, I mean even even Azure Container, Azure Kubernetes Service, you're kind of operating your own cluster. Um, and so if you're just getting into this, I would highly recommend take some baby steps. Do use Kubernetes by way of Azure Container Apps first, and l then look to see if you bump a uh, bump up against you know any any walls where you look at the full feature set that you could via AKS, and you might find that you know what none of those extra features in the AKS feature set are interesting, and if so, then then you know stay where you are. Now, if if you do um, if you do find that you start craving some of those features, okay, give it a shot. But if you're just getting into Kubernetes, start with Azure Container Apps because just like the you know the Agile Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. You might not. You probably won't need it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I, I I thought it was like more bound to requirements than a number, and they ended up implementing a, a Kubernetes cluster here. But for for the size of the project, it seems a little bit of overhead and difficult now to go back. But was more thinking for my own, you know, uh, knowledge. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm a big proponent of starting small and learning, and then and then going from there. All right, anyone else? Mr. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, yes, I understood, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm right, that Dapper in the environment uh, section is uh, working like a DNS service? Yes. Is it Microsoft yes. way? Yes, that's why, that's why I kind of compared it to a runtime IOC container because for for dependencies of interfaces and implementations in .NET, we we kind of register where things are, and then any code can just ask for the interface, and I automatically get connected with the implementation. Same thing with with DNS. I have containers running all over in various pods, and if all of them are registered with DAPR, then I can just ask for the friendly name of that particular container, that particular uh, you know code service that's running. And I instantly get connected to it without having to have an address configured in my environment variables. Excellent, thank you. And one more thing, uh, I uh, made uh, uh, some testing in a web page on AWS, and uh, I had a load balancer. Uh, and uh, in the case of mixing versions, uh, I had uh, an issue because it was, uh, well, segregating the requests uh, uh, according to the, the balancing, uh, uh, well, uh, segments. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it was mixing assets. I mean, uh, taking some CSS from uh, one revision and taking some uh, JavaScript from the other revision. So the resulting uh, web page in, in the browser was mixed and it, it had issues. Is it the case in Azure? Okay, that's a, okay, that's a good question. That sounds like, that sounds like a challenge that, that web browsers are going to give us because web browsers are going to cache static files based on the URL. And so, you know, .js files, .css files, images, browsers like to cache static resources instead of literally going and getting them every single time you click on something. And so under the covers, you might, yeah, with the multi-revisions, you're going to have different code running but it's all running under the same URL. So the browser doesn't know. And if your purpose is to serve a different static resource, then what you're gonna have to do is give those static resources non-static names. Like you might, you might need to 
dynamically serve up the JavaScript files in order to get in order to get the round robin or the A B effect. And that sounds like you might be fighting against the browser's caching tendency. Excellent. This thing of the dynamic names uh, could make it. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. And, and by the way, for the for the multi revision capability in Azure Container Apps, um, you can uh, just looks like in, in in Azure App Service when you have multiple instances running. You have the capability to turn on, effect, you know, the sticky sessions capability where if you start on one, it'll kind of automatically route you to the same running process versus round robin. The same thing with Azure Container Apps. Um, you've got that sticky, you got the sticky sessions or you've got the round robin configuration to choose from. Perfect. All right, any other questions before we close up? All right, well, thank you, group. And Daniel and Ashish, thanks thanks for inviting me. I had, had fun. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, awesome thanks, presentation. Our questions at the end. Um, again, I'm not going to name everything again, but all the stuff I shouted out at the beginning is in the chat, uh, especially the feedback form. Check that out for both Jeffrey and the group itself. And uh, other than that, we'll see everybody next month. Thanks for coming. Awesome. See y'all. Thank you, everyone. Have a thriving Thank you. Thursday. Thank you.